strange creature has been spotted in Doha, Qatar. A great white shark navigating its way through the city's streets. A startling sight. It's an image of an artwork featured in an equally astonishing exhibition at the Al Riwaq Gallery near the Museum of Islamic Art. Alongside this piece are some of the most famous artworks in the world. I think in this retrospective, you have at least a handful of works that they are cornerstone of art history and particularly of the history of contemporary art of the last 20 years. All these works are by one of the world's most successful and groundbreaking living artists. His work, it's incredibly powerful. You know, he was somebody who did something completely different than art. He is one of the artists currently working that we can say without any fear of contradiction. He will have a major place in the art history of our particular era. Damien Hurst. The new Damien Hurst exhibition in Doha is his first solo show in the Middle East. It showcases the career of an artist who has transformed the nature of contemporary art. It's his largest ever retrospective, exhibiting 27 years of work to a new audience. I mean, I hope that people are going to be excited by it. As an artist, you try and make work that's international and that's, you know, cross-cultural. So I think it's a good test of that. Lots of wow, I would hope. أعتقد أن أهم شيء في الفن هو أن يثير الجدل ويثير الكلام والتفكير وأعتقد أن كثير من قطع الفنية لديمين هيرس تؤثر الجدل والتفكير وهذا شيء مهم جدا ونحتاج أن نرى التفكير غير التفكير العربي أو الإسلامي أن نتفهم التفكير الذي يأتي من أماكن أخرى. This show is creating dialogue, and I think that is the most crucial thing to create dialogue and to take away the fear of the unknown. I think every exhibition you do is always special. Every aspect of it is always special. You know, seeing a whole new environment, new country. I've done 25 years of kind of you know crazy stuff and lots of different ideas, and so I think it is a good you know it's a good. It feels comfortable to look back, and I'm enjoying it really. The staging of this major retrospective has involved months of complex preparation, including the immersing of this enormous 6.8 meter long basking shark in 60,000 liters of formaldehyde solution. Happy to go up? How are you doing? 
For over two months, this breathtaking new piece and others from around the globe have been installed at the Al Riwak Gallery. It's one of the biggest shows we've done. Definitely the biggest museum retrospective show. It's uh, over 90 works, which over six and a half weeks we'll install them. We have between 30 and 40 technicians on site, along with uh, six conservators as well, all working together to bring the show and make it happen. This is you know, the biggest show that he's done so far. We've got to obviously had to move a lot more artworks. We're moving them, you know, six and a half thousand miles around the world. So instead of just shipping and trucking things across the country, we've used uh, these huge C-17 military transport planes. One day we received a phone call from General Ali from the Emiri Air Force to see if they could help in the organization of, of this show. And they have a wonderful plane called the C-17. They have many of them. And, and, and we were able to use them. The works in this show tell the story of Damien Hirst's remarkable artistic career. His newest work, created especially for this exhibition, is Leviathan, the giant basking shark now on display in Doha for the first time. It's the latest and largest in the series of shark pieces that made Hearst famous. I got a phone call a few years back from the Natural History Museum and they said, we've just been given a huge basking shark. It's been washed up on a beach dead somewhere in Cornwall. And they said, Will you store it for us? So I said, yeah, because I had the studio big enough. And I was working with them on preservation anyway. And I looked after it for, him for a few months, and then they called up and just said, look, we've got no space for it, do you want to keep it? So I went, yeah. And then thought I'll, do I'll make a piece called Leviathan, but and I've been working on it since then, really. I'd read that book, Leviathan, by Thomas Hobbes. I think he says that life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short, and that's his view of the world. Leviathan is about the unknown something murky and dark and deep from the bottom of the sea, from an unknown area, inside your mind even, or you know, something un unknowable or difficult to fathom, from fathoms deep. Leviathan is scary because it's a beast, it's something that you do hear about in the stories, you don't think something like that exists. Whoever will see it, it will find it. Not just spectacular, they will find it really almost moving. Hearst's iconic shark series began over 20 years ago with a work called The Physical Impossibility of Death in the Mind of Someone Living. There was only one idea, it was that one from Jaws. I mean, I was a kid when I went to see Jaws and it was terrifying but great. And I like horror films, I like being scared. A long time ago, I saw Richard Serra's sculpture at the Sarcher Gallery. And I remember it was two curved pieces of metal, and I remember looking at it thinking, you know, so what? And then I walked through the middle of it. As I got halfway through, I, I got physically frightened that it could fall on me, because you don't know how it's held up. And you kind of run out the other side, and you sort of parts going like that, and I thought, wow, that's a great reaction to a sculpture, to get a physical reaction from it. And so, you know, the shark idea first came from that. I just thought, you know, what would be amazing is to get a, get a shark in a gallery big enough to eat you in a volume of liquid that makes you feel a little bit like you do if you were in the sea with it. You're confronted immediately by this violent creature. I mean, no matter how much animal rights activists want to tell me that the shark is, is a nice creature, I'm sorry, it isn't. It's actually terrifying, and so there is fear. Automatically, you are confronted with fear. Damien Hirst's sharks have made an enormous impact on the popular imagination. Above all, because they push at the boundaries of what art is, like the natural history series to which they belong, described by Damien as a zoo of dead animals in formaldehyde. To promote the exhibition and to encourage debate about Damien Hirst's art, the Qatar Museum's authority has taken the museum experience into the everyday world. 
مرحبا بك أنت على وشك مشاهدة صورة لقطعة فنية معاصرة من أعمال الفنان ديميان هيرس ما هو شعورك بعد مشاهدة هذا العمل؟ لديك 15 ثانية لتخبرنا عن رأيك بعد سماع الصافرة شعري أحس إني في البحر لمس الصورة حلوة معبرة وحلوة وحبيتها مخيف مخيف جدا وما أتمنى إني أقرب عند هذا العمل وايد حلوة أشعر بالعنف وبالثار وبالرغبة الجامحة للانتقام ايش شكله مخيف بس ظريف يعني كيوت الا البلو از كيوت شكرا لك The museum has also invited local school and university students to Al-Ruwak to experience the exhibition firsthand. Among the works producing the strongest reactions is one of Damien Hirst's earliest pieces and the first artwork to secure his place in art history. A thousand years. A glass cabinet divided in two, containing hundreds of flies. On one side, flies are born. On the other, they feed on a decaying cow's head before being killed by an electric insectocutor. I mean, I was at a funny point in my life when I made A Thousand Years, and I wanted to make something that was important uh, in, you know, in a big way. And I just had this idea of, of showing a whole life cycle in a box. And then I decided it was going to be flies with a fly killer. And then I wanted to wanted everything to, you know, the randomness of them living, dying, breeding, being, and just having it all in a box. With a thousand years, there is life happening right in front of you. It's not pretty, <laughs> that's for sure. But it, again, it provokes you, it, it gets you to start thinking. I mean, I was taught to, you know, to confront things you can't avoid, and death is one of those things. So I don't, think, I don't think any artist can make art without dealing with death. You can see many things in a thousand years. You can see humanity seen from far away, moving around aimlessly. Humanity is attracted to our, uh, something that lights, what is, can be money, can be fame, can be, can be success, and then, you know, sometimes we touch it and we die. That's the most traditional subject in art, the life cycle, life and death. And here was a young artist, barely 20, who understood many of the grand themes of art history and wanted to try and confront them and, and, and represent them um, in his own way. It was an amazing work. This piece, like many others in the show, demonstrates Damien Hirst's status as one of the world's leading conceptual artists, inspired by a form of expression that engages the mind as much as the eye. Conceptual art says that the art lies in the mind of the view and not in the object itself, and that's all the conceptual art's saying. It's, not, it's nothing different. I mean, you know, conceptual art is just art. That's not complicated, I don't think. I mean, it's a visual language. You know, if you've got a beach ball floating on a jet of air and you go, wow, what's this to understand? And then if you want to take it up a step further and go, well, I suppose life's like that, then you go, cool. But if you don't, you don't have to go to that second level or the third level or the fourth, it doesn't matter where you are. If you just go, yeah, I like it. Why? Because I like the colors and it's, and how does it work? And it looks like magic. You go, well, that's great. Two floating balls express very well the philosophy of Damien. One is a colorful ball that is a playful object, that can make you happy. And the other one, uh, the history of pain, create a kind of tension in looking at it because you always expect the ball to fall on the knife and explode. 
that is so simple and it contains exactly what our life is about. We try always to be playful and happy, but we know that our happiness, our pleasure, our uh, beauty can always collapse. Often, he uses the whole idea of the found object. His idea was, how do you make art more real? If um, photography can reproduce mechanically something, where is it left for the painter or sculptor to go? Well, actually, let's try and make it more real then than photography. And the easy way of doing that is, let's have the real thing. Let's try and make art as close to life as possible. Let's blur those distinctions. I wanted things to be real. I didn't want paintings, I didn't want light boxes, and I didn't want, you know, a lot of my friends were doing that, but I wanted reality. I wanted you to be forced to look at reality. I've always thought when you go to an art gallery that the great reaction is, wow. And I think you get that a lot in, like, the Natural History Museum, a lot more, sadly, than you do in contemporary art galleries. And so I've always just, you know, when I've been looking for ways to do things, I always thought, you just take, you steal it, just take that and put it into an art gallery, and take that and put it into an art gallery. Perhaps Damien's most audacious attempt to take from life and put it in a gallery is this work, Pharmacy. I made Pharmacy in New York when I'd done the medicine cabinets where you put them on the wall and then you go, wow, what, you know, why is that in here? Shouldn't that be in a chemist? And then I thought I'd do a show where you actually think you're in the wrong gallery. So you're, in, you're not in the gallery. And it was when you opened the elevator, you came out, you came out into the pharmacy. So it was like people kept coming in and getting back out in the lift and leaving and coming back and getting in and leaving. And I just made the, you know, the whole gallery into a pharmacy. But this installation was about much more than expanding the definition of art. It's an exploration of belief systems, the faith that we place in medicine. Pharmaceuticals are religious in a way. I mean, it's the promise of immortality, isn't it? The hope of immortality, even though immortality is not really on the cards. For Hurst, it's the visual power of the pharmacy that makes us believe. It's an environment steeped in minimalism, an aesthetic defined by use of cool, clean, geometric forms and bold colours. There's a reason why the pharmaceutical companies use minimalism to sell us highly priced plant extracts. And it's because they can trick us into believing that we actually can have a piece of immortality. You're not going to be buying cancer medicines if they've got big stars on them saying two for the price of one, 75% off. You're just not going to believe it. So it's perfect clinical moulded shapes and colours that just says, trust us, we're going to make your body last forever. And you go, yeah, cool, I'll have a packet of those. Damien's belief in the inherent beauty and seductive power of minimalism characterises much of his art. Perhaps most clearly in his trademark spot paintings, which began in 1986 and subsequently evolved into an endless series. Some of the latest are on display for the first time in Doha. I mean, I've just always loved colour. I mean, I think the spot paintings, you know, they always look happy and they're... You know, you can't help desiring them, they look good. Put that one there, that one there, one there, that one there. Yeah, yeah, give that a go. I think art should always be beautiful, absolutely. I totally think art needs to be beautiful. It annoys me when things are ugly. So that one moves to here. That one should sort of go like that. Is the ball height good? Um, you happy with the height of the ball? Yeah. The effort and the, the time that's put into each of the works is sort of endless. What about that right thing? I need to ro rotate the chart a little bit down this way, so I look a bit lower. It's all about the finished product and getting to make it look a million dollars and look absolutely perfect at the end of the day. Perhaps the most delicate works to be installed and without question the most valuable are two skulls covered in a combined total of 16,729 diamonds. 
entitled for the love of God and for heaven's sake these skulls are being exhibited together for the first time. By 2007, when the first skull was completed, Damien had become one of the world's most successful and wealthiest artists. When I had huge amounts of money coming in, I thought, well, I've got to make something huge that needs huge amounts of money to make it. And I was surrounded by lots of money, and I think as an artist, you make art from what's around you. And, you know, there was money, you know, because of the whole, you know, a lot of rich people had a lot of spare cash and they were spending it on art, so I used that to make the diamond skull. And for the love of God, Damien returns to his fascination with the central reality of all our lives. Our mortality. But the first goal was made just, you know, thinking about what's the maximum amount of wealth you can throw at death. And I think it's decorative, and decorative in art's considered a criticism, really, isn't it? But then when it comes to dealing with death, it seems like all you can do is decorate. Clearly in the diamond skull, 8,601 flawless diamonds is a statement about man's flawed aspirations, the values systems that we put on materials, the whole exchange idea that's there in, in any market, including the art market. It's almost insulting to mankind because it's telling you that this is what you're after today, it's, it's vanity. It's sad to say, but in many respects, it's reality. I think I'd almost finished it. And then I started to realize that white diamonds aren't the rarest. Rarer and far more valuable are the pink diamonds, which Damien used to create his next skull, that of a baby cast in platinum. I think it's got the same amount of diamonds, practically, as the, as the other skull. And I love the idea of th that something could be even more valuable, but smaller. But their combined price tag of $120 million has led to concerns that money is overwhelming art. All that talk doesn't take away from the work. For something to be art, it's got to be about more than money, because you can't take it with you. It's, you know, there's got to be another reason for living. There's got to be, you know, more to life than that. People fear that ultimately that maybe money is more important than art. But from an artist's point of view, you know, that's never really a fear. This piece is it's art history, and the great thing about the great work of art, everybody has an opinion. I mean, mixed feelings, I, I always think, is really good. You need a bit of that, you know, because you think it's, you know, people are, you know, if they're discussing it, it means it's got energy. And if everybody loves it, you probably, as an artist, would think maybe I've done something wrong. In the fortnight after the opening alone, Damien Hurst's relics received over 10,000 visitors. <laughs> العالم لأول مرة يعني أخذ معلومات بشكل عام حبيت يعني أنا حبيت في المعرض إن فكرة التحنيب يعني فكرتها إنه وتكلم عن دورة الحياة أكثر شيء مرتحتش معاه ال الفلايز أو الذباب ممكن لأن الذباب في قطر مختلف عن شكل الذباب الكبير مش البقرة يعني رأس البقرة مع إنه هو ممكن يكون مزعج أكثر but I was afraid of the birds. The idea was a new idea for us to make a new idea in the field of the birds. It was a very strange idea. Even the road was very good and very good. It was a very important part of the birds in the field. بعض الأعمال الفنية لها مرجعية في الثقافة الموجودة هنا مثلا الأدوات الجراحية المعروضة بعضها تم اكتشافه عن طريق العلماء المسلمين في العصر الذهبي للإسلام وده شيء احنا نحب نتكلم عنه مع طلاب المدارس 
الفراش والحيوانات ما لهمش لغه ما لهمش بلد فكلنا بنشوف الفراشات كلنا بنشوف الجمال في الفراشات Looks great, I love it. I think it's the best show I've ever done. Uh, you know, I hope everybody loves that. I defy people not to like it.